2024, 5 p.m. to 4. Um, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence. Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. so that everyone has an understanding of in detail what we're asking for. But tonight is more of a general, how does that financing uh, work? So Erica Haynes has been to Montville a couple times to do this, and I've used her as a sounding board when I have questions. She works for the State and School Finance Project, and she travels all around the state speaking to evening adult groups like this, classes of students on uh, topics, just as you're going to hear tonight, around just how does this whole finance project work. We're really lucky to have her. She has left on the back table um, some cards so that you have contact information. I will be uh, posting this presentation so people can see the slides, and we're, we're also recording it so we can post to people that weren't here if you want to let them know that. Um, but the one incredible thing about Erica is she makes herself a resource to all of you. So if anyone has questions afterwards, um, she will respond like that, and she's got so much knowledge, we're really pleased to have her. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out um, on our, what, ninth or tenth day with no sunshine, and, and the days are blurring together. Um, so let me start by um, telling you my contact information is also in here, so you'll be able to reach out to me. Um, and I will talk a little about our organization, but just so you know, there's a beautiful lag in clicking here. Be patient with me as I learn the lag. After it worked, it worked. There we go. Um, you also have cards. We have an app for your phone and desktop um, that, that lets you look at every district, school spending and school performance, as well as compare those. So um, if you're out and about and have an urgent need to look at school finance on the go, um, it's accessible for you. And then the next slide, and we're just going to have to work with the lag here, um, we do have an online certificate program. Um, that that helps walk you through all aspects of school finance as well. Um, a little about us, we started as an organization in 2015, and for those of you who were occupying the space in 2015, it's not that. It might hiccup a little tonight, that's okay. Um, we had started at a point where they were no longer at the state level using our school finance formula and school funding was delivered to communities as block grants. So our organization is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that really looks at how does state funding move to schools in Connecticut and is there a better way to do that? Um, so we work across the state collaboratively at all levels. So um, as a resource to legislators, to parents, to students, to boards of ed, and to superintendents. Um, I work across the state. I'm the director of uh, community engagement for the organization. And I work across the state. We have um, community members in about 85 communities at this point. Um, I'm a Norwich native. So this side of the state is um, my life. Um, a year and a half ago, I moved to Litchfield, so um, I enjoy being back here so much. 
Um, and, and my job, um, fortunately, is really to just go and talk about this to everybody and to really help um, get you all in, into a place where you're comfortable talking about it. So we're going to blow through um, what Montville right now spends, where that money comes from, and how it gets to you, and some of the, the significant pieces of impact on education funding. I have my warm milk. Um, I had no voice the entire week last week. Lori, I was afraid you were going to have to be up here doing this on your own. So I'm a little raspier than usual, and I apologize for that. We're going to start with an overview, just at the state level. So in the state of Connecticut, in education spending every year, it's about $12.1 billion moving through. Um, and it's broken out in spending in um, resources in three ways. That top narrow blue band, that's federal funding coming from the federal government into the state. It's pretty small and not to minimize uh, uh, more than half a billion dollars, but in the scope of $12.1 billion, it's fairly small. One of the things to know is that state wealth is taken into consideration when federal resources are moved to our states. So we have a, a small amount of federal resources. That big green band at the bottom, $7.2 billion, that is local communities like Montville and Norwich and Stanford and Litchfield deciding how much they are investing in education at a local level. So 169 decision-making bodies contributing to that 7.2 billion. And the orange 4.5 billion, that's state dollars. And that's where we're gonna spend most of our time tonight in talking about how state dollars move to school districts. So in Montville, when we, I want to point out that when we look at, at per pupil spending, we're really trying to find districts that are as close to apples to apples as possible. Um, and so we look at a few things, but I will first tell you that the state average right now at, at per pupil spending is $20,165. And I'm going to put a little asterisk there and just um, flag for you that that number has changed very dramatically and will change again because the ESSER dollars, the federal COVID relief dollars, bumped up that per pupil average in a way that is not going to be sustained. So it will drop down again. Pre-COVID, it was um, closer to 17,000. Um, and so when we're looking at this, and I will tell you too, the range Right now in Connecticut is from um, a little over 16,000 up to a little more than 60,000. Um, and so numbers and averages are just that, numbers and averages. And there's not this ideal target number that you're trying to hit. When we're looking at comparable districts, a huge part of that is Who's in your school district? Who are your, you educating? Um, and what is the size of, of that, that district? And we look in a few ways. The first is looking at the low income population as measured by qualification for free and reduced price lunch. The second is multilingual learners. The third category, students with disabilities. And the final category is black, indigenous, people of color, black and brown students in the district. And we look across uh, these districts that we pulled um, and, and what you're looking at. And this is really nice, I think, for you all to be able to look at where are you similar and where are you different. So when we look at Montville, for instance, with 42% low income students, and you look at Ledyard, Ledyard is drastically different with only 20%. Um, the same holds true when you start looking across lines. This, I'm getting good at it. <laughs> with multilingual learners at 4.5% versus, say, Ledyard at 1.3%, it really does start to matter who is in that school. And in part because we have a student-weighted funding formula 
that, that adds funding based on needs. Two categories that are weighted are students who are in economic disadvantage, free and reduced price lunch, and multilingual learners, because those students come with unique and additional needs above a general education student. And when you're looking at this, what you're actually able to see then is, for instance, Waterford. Waterford is contributing almost all of their, their education spending is coming from local property taxes with very little state support and then some federal support. Um, I will also tell you that the federal support in Connecticut is most tightly tied to two things. One is, again, children who are in economic disadvantage, and the second is special education. Um, so, so you can start looking at where are we alike and how much is their municipality contributing? What are the factors that are changing that? And so we're gonna go through the factors that bring Montville the state dollars that they do, so you can see how that formula works. Meander over here and not try to push the system too hard. There we go. Um, there is no right per pupil spending, and I think that's really important. Um, I crave a moment in time where where some fantastic academic institution says we have found the perfect number, and if you spend this much per student, it's exactly right. But that doesn't exist. So it's a range, and across the country, amounts vary greatly, and um, across the country, governance structures for education vary greatly, which matter as well. So we're gonna talk about the education cost-sharing formula. This is the formula that is used to distribute state education to municipalities state education aid. This, this is the, the fundamental flow for you all. Um, and this works for both local and regional public school districts. I will tell you this is not magnet schools. In Connecticut, currently we have 11 funding formulas. It depends on the type of school, who is managing the school, where the school is located. So in Connecticut, local and regional public schools are funded by the education cost sharing formula. This is a result of a 1977 lawsuit that said it's fundamentally unfair to rely on property taxes to fully fund education. And in Connecticut, currently, we have more than $50 billion brand list difference between our most wealthy community and our least wealthy community. So it makes sense, right? Education becomes different if you're relying solely on property tax. So the state's role is to equitize that and to ensure that they are fulfilling their obligations and making sure all kids are getting the same access to education. And so if you look, the first implementation was 11 years after that ruling in 1988. To date, the state of Connecticut has never made it through full implementation of the education cost sharing formula. It's in fits and starts in 10 year phases, and they've never fully made it through a 10 year phase in. Um, how money flows is going to be from the state capital to a city or town hall and then to a school district. Connecticut has what is called fiscally dependent school districts. They can't bond or raise property taxes on their own, so the money flows first through the municipality and then to the school district. I'm just gonna stand right over here. So it starts with the basic premise, right? If we need to figure out how much Montville can afford for education, or Norwalk, or Granby, but we have, to, we have to figure out first, how much does education cost in any given community? So the way it starts is by an assumption that there is a cost to educating a child with no additional learning needs, a general education student. 
and that cost is $11,525. It is set by the legislature. It is an arbitrary number. So I don't have the science and research to back that up for you. It has also been $11,525 for a very, very long time. Um, and yet that is the number. So we start there by saying for every child who has no additional or unique learning needs, it's going to be $11,525. But I told you that we have a student-weighted funding formula in Connecticut. This education cost sharing formula looks at a couple of different things. The first is a low-income student weight. For children who are in economic disadvantage, it is assumed that it costs about 30% more to educate those kids, which means they're going to add 30% to that base foundation amount of $11,525. In communities with more than 60% of their kids living in economic disadvantage, there's a concentrated impact. So for the number of kids over 60%, there's an additional 15% weight added on. And then finally, multilingual learners. There is a, a cost to robustly educating multilingual learners. And it's assumed that it's 25% above the 11,525. Fast. <laughs> what you get to see here is that money matters, especially when we're talking about equipping and resourcing a district to educate their kids. These, these weights are not mutually exclusive, meaning you can get the weights for a concentrated poverty, multilingual learner, and all of that changes the dollars. So these, these numbers are used because Connecticut looks at who's in any education system, any school district, and what needs do they have, as we did at the start of this. And we're going to walk through what this looks like for Montville. But if we tally up what does it cost to educate Montville's kids? The second piece of the education cost sharing formula is how much can Montville afford to pay and how much state support does Montville need in order to educate their kids? And they do this by what's called the base aid ratio. And the base aid ratio is looking at two things, property wealth. How much money can any community raise in property taxes? And income wealth. If you raise your property taxes, can your community members actually afford to pay them? So it looks at that at a rate of 70% property wealth, 30% income wealth. Now, additionally, Connecticut looks at, and every year, Connecticut measures the economic health and well-being of its communities in what's called the Public Investment Communities Index, or PIC Index. This is done by the state of Connecticut, and it ranks communities and gives you points. The higher the score, the more economically distressed the community. And this is on a scale of 0 to 500. Hartford is always number one, running somewhere between 495 and 498, typically. Um, and it goes down from there. At the time this new ECS formula was passed, which was 2017, there were 19 towns over 300. And legislators determined that 300 is kind of that tipping point for economic distress in a community. So the top scoring towns, the most economically distressed, 19, get additional points added to their base aid ratio, um, adding a little bit more equity um, from the state funding to that community. Every year, this grant is recalculated. 
So these are all the moving factors every single year that they're looking at in, in calculating what this grant is going to be. So let's walk through Montville's. Go first. No. <laughs> I know it's small. I'm gonna. This is when y'all who sat in the back, away from sitting in the front, you're like, oh, now I can't see as well. Um, so for the fiscal 24 um, model, the resident student count that was used was 2,176 students. Um, for those of you who don't know, Connecticut counts students one day a year in October. Um, it's called a butts and seats count, really. How many kids are actually in the school? They have to be here in order to be counted. Um, of that 2,176 students, how many students are considered low income through free and reduced price lunch? That number is 937. How many multilingual learners do you have? In Montville, you have an even 100. Um, and the percentage of low-income students for concentrated poverty is at 43%, so less than the 60% threshold. But now they just put that all through that weighted funding, right? How much does everybody need in order to get supported? And they say, okay, it's going to cost Montville $28,600,000 and some change to educate their kids. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause right here and tell you that number, you, you actually can't use that number. Because there's something missing from that number that I'm telling you right now. Because we haven't talked about special education students. And they're, they're not in this. So um, don't match up your district budget to that budget. It will never, it will never be right. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So, how does it determine the multilingual learners count? That's curious. How, did, how does the state determine that? It's reported by the district. That's actually from us. Yeah. Thank you. So away we go then with this whole how much can Montville afford to pay then? And they're looking at that equalized net grant list per capita. They're looking at median household income, right? Property wealth, household income, property taxes, and can you afford to pay them? You are not an alliance district. Alliance districts are, at this point now, the 36th lowest performing districts in the state. It has grown over the years. We have worked together. Um, your, your ranking on the PIC index is 30 with a score of 290. Um, and so when they do the math, the base aid ratio, the percentage <coughs> share is about 42 and a half percent. And so it's about 12 million from the state. So if you think about that, right, about 28 million was, was going to be the total cost, about 12 million, they're saying you, you all can't afford that 12 million. Um, now, I told you, Connecticut has been on a long and fantastic journey with education cost sharing since 1988. When they abandoned the formula in roughly 2012, they delivered block grants. Block grants had zero connectivity to the number of kids in the schools. Zero connectivity. And it was based arbitrarily on what you got the year before. And if they were going to increase, everybody increased, and if they were going to decrease, everybody decreased. And until we implemented this new formula in 2018, and it was passed in 2017, that's how it was done. So when the new formula got passed, and they're looking at the math now, there are towns that are overfunded and towns that were underfunded. Meaning, your student population changed in roughly five plus years that they weren't looking at it at all and they weren't aligning funding to it. So when the, when the formula got passed, 10 years for towns who were going to gain to get to their full gain and 10 years for towns that were going to lose to lose what they were going to lose, to be evened out to where they were supposed to be. 
So Montville has been losing over time. I will tell you that um, over time, that phase out has been extended by an additional four years. So um, it's a 14 year phase out and looking from where we are now at 12.8 million uh, to fiscal 32 getting to 12.1 million. It's a phase out over that time of about $700,000. Remember, I'm just the messenger. <laughs> So what does this mean, right? This is where it ends up being how much can we afford to pay in our community? How much do we need to invest? What are our property taxes looking like? And, and your, your school district budget that they're gonna, you're all gonna see in a couple of weeks is, is really your superintendent and board of ed know what it's gonna cost to educate the kids based on the programs that they want to run. They can easily take away that federal and state revenue, it's fairly predictable, and they're left asking taxpayers in the community to invest. That's how we get here. So clearly, there's a huge piece of this discussion that is wealth and property tax. And in Connecticut, this is a fabulous conversation. Um, it really is one of the most fundamentally flawed parts of our education funding system. And I will tell you that I've been doing this since 2016. Um, I had a conversation with a data analyst yesterday, because I'm like, tell me now. I want to know, what does that mean? What does it mean that, that we rely too much on property taxes. Well, Connecticut has about a 15% greater reliance on property taxes than the rest of the nation on average. That's huge. That's what you all are fighting about, right? In any community, and I'm not saying you all are fighting, but every community is really struggling with what are the municipal costs? What are the education costs? I was a former city councilor. I get it. So that's the crux of, of this system. And I think it's important when we talk about this, in Connecticut, this, is, this, is, this matters, right? More than $50 billion property wealth difference across communities in Connecticut. And so the state median is at 2.2 billion and Montville's at 2.3 billion. But when you look at some systems that are thriving with lower property taxes, this is the reason for that. Um, and so when we equalize that, right, you can go, yeah, but Greenwich, Greenwich is huge, and yeah, they've got that big you know, property wealth, like I saw Union on the list, or Scotland. We know Scotland has one commercial property on their, their rolls, right? So let's equalize that and look at what does that mean as far as taxable property per person in that community. And so when you look at the state median at 153, you're looking at Greenwich over here at 770,000. Um, Y'all are over here at 112,000. These things matter and we don't talk about them enough. Um, I just made my 14-year-old sit through my passionate diatribe about this yesterday. He asked a question, which was foolish, and we went away and had this conversation. But, but when you look at what this does to property taxes across the state, it, it's pretty astonishing, right? Um, and so here we are over here, and we're looking at a $300,000 house. And I have other slides that I don't have in here, but you can take this out and you can say, well, how many, how big of a house can I get in Greenwich for what I'm paying for property taxes in Waterbury? It's huge. Like that's a that that's an impact. So and and, and what you have to understand here, just as you see some of these disparities, it is that 
the lower the community wealth, the higher the property taxes, the greater the struggle. And it's a cycle. Um, so I think it's, it's a, a really important piece of this to understand some of these dynamics and to really understand what, why, are, why are we struggling with this? Why don't we have access to everything in a way that we need to? Um, we do have, um, we did look based on community requests. So in community, um, you know, and, and Laura said it well, I'm a resource. So this summer we, we got a question about well, what, what do tax abatements do to education funding? What's the relationship there? And so we did some research and we have that there if you'd like to look more. Um, but, but you're making choices as a municipality with tax abatements and they can have an impact on school funding. And there's a lot that goes into that, but um, we do have more information if that's a question. So current local education budget trends and drivers. I um, thought I would kind of share some of what we're seeing and what we know is happening um, across the state so that you can start thinking about, is this happening here? So that you're empowered to have this conversation related to your budget. Um, we're seeing um, growth in generally the five to eight percent range um, and and over the last week i'm seeing more um, more of the eight percent side of budget asks across the state and less of the five percent um, so we're seeing we're seeing pretty high asks and we're seeing that boards of education are really struggling to maintain those programs that were implemented as a result of the federal ESSER dollars coming into the district um, so when you look at what the drivers are, there's an ESSER fiscal cliff. So federal funding was one-time funding, which was fabulous, meant to deal with the effects of, of the pandemic, and it's going away. And when it's all disappearing at once um, and not helping you sustain programs, that's a cliff. And yeah, I will say, and it's, it's been on the news for the last few days, the problems the pandemic brought to us in education have not been mitigated. So the funding is going away, and yet achievement in Connecticut hasn't reached its 2019 levels. Um, chronic absenteeism is a pervasive problem across the state. And so, so at the same time, these dollars are disappearing you have all of those ongoing problems to still wrestle with, right? It's not like you can go back to what we were doing before the pandemic because everything returned that way. So the pressures on school districts are, are strong. Inflation has been a driver, particularly in utility costs, we're seeing that. Um, labor agreements, um, all the times that unions kind of waived uh, an increase are now kind of at the door for everybody and so we're seeing a lot of labor agreements with increases that and and labor is your highest cost in any school district so labor agreements drive budgets insurance um, medical insurance in particular for everyone that put off all of their health care until after the pandemic so it was really low and now it's spiking and it's just a little bonkers <coughs> right now. So that's driving budgets. And, and again, those student needs, right? You're still struggling with how do you get kids to school? How do you keep them engaged? Our disengaged youth level is higher than it's ever been. So, so it is kind of, this year is really a perfect storm for, for boards of ed. It's just fun tonight for us, y'all. Um, special education. I want to talk about special education for a minute because it doesn't exist in the education cost sharing formula. So we, we went through exactly how Montville is getting their state aid for education, and special education never came up. 
So in about 1995, legislators made a choice to move special ed, which was a separate stream of funding, into ECS. So now what they say is that about 20% of your ECS is special education funding. And yet, we walk through the math of how your education cost sharing dollars are determined. Um, and, and so, that's another tension. Connecticut is one of few states with no special education funding method allocated to it. Um, I think we're reduced to us in West Virginia at this point. Um, so special education, after it's in your education cost sharing formula, which it isn't, but it is, um, there is no special education aid from the state until a student has, has cost the district more than four and a half times the average per pupil expenditure. And at that point, districts can submit for reimbursement, but it's not a dollar for dollar reimbursement. And in fact, they spent a couple of years working to try to increase the percentage of reimbursement, only to discover a miscalculation, and this year we're back to about 72%. Um, so special education, and that percentage that we looked at right at the beginning of who's in Montville Public Schools, that matters. Um, so students are required to get a free and appropriate education in the least restrictive environment possible, keeping them in classrooms with their peers with supports. Um, and it's called FAPE. Um, and so there's a lot of uncertainty with that. One of the things is that when you graduate a group of 12th graders and you have a group of kindergartners come in, it is not a one-for-one -one swap of unique learning needs, right? So, so it's a constant process of identification, not just in what does the student need, but how can the schools best support them that is unpredictable. You're doing your budget now, right? For kindergartners that are going to have a whole bunch of needs in special education that you really don't know right now as you're building your budget. So special education is, is one of the greatest areas of uncertainty as, as you're doing this work. Um, so over the last 10 years, in Connecticut, the number of kids in public school has declined by 6.6%. We're, we're matching with the nation. Um, and you can see a real cliff there that is related to COVID, right? But um, those numbers really haven't bounced back again from COVID. Where, where are they going? I mean, if, if we're bouncing with the rest of the country, where, where are the kids going? Um, yeah, I think, I think there's, a, there's a small piece that is, you know, homeschools or alternative settings. Um, there's certainly nationally a bigger move for online education. Connecticut doesn't have that same option. Um, and, and really, truly, too, kids just aren't having kids in the same way, right? I had four. I was foolish. I had four. The hits just keep coming, 14 to 29. I have, my oldest daughter has one, and she's like, we're done. Like, you're done? What? I didn't know that was an option. Someone should have told me that. Um, so I think it's a combination, but there's also, in part, there are pieces of this that are economic. We see more kids doing um, low education jobs to help support families. The, the, the economic struggles um, particularly in the lower class, really have, have fallen on teenagers in particular. So, so there's a, a lot happening, but what we do see is that special education is increasing. 
um, by about 7.7%. So special ed is increasing at the same time population is decreasing. So you're going to see a bigger percentage of kids in your school with unique special education needs. So at the state level, the spending has been predictable, right? That's a nice steady slope for the most part. You, you start seeing that there's a real uptick right after the, the first year or so of COVID as everybody's trying to get back into the classroom. Um, but at the local level, right, it's really easy to look at this and say, oh, it's such predictable spending. Connecticut is very hyper-local. 169 communities, over 200 school districts. What that means is a kid who moves from here to Waterford, to New London, to Broughton, um, one child can really swing an education budget, in special education in particular. So Connecticut funds special education primarily through the ECS grant. Um, and then through excess cost. So we had this here, and then I think about two or three weeks ago, um, there's a determination that the excess cost grant is indeed not fully funded. And in fact, the shortfall is going to put them at about 70% reimbursement without tears. So um, that's changed rather rapidly, as have some other things. But um, these were the tiers that have been introduced so that um, districts were more able to predict what they were going to get in reimbursement. But if your district built a budget thinking that there was going to be this level of reimbursement for excess costs this year, they just found out from the state that's not going to hold. Um, just a little on ESSER funding, the, the federal dollars. There was over $189 billion invested through ESSER, and it's all coming to a close. Um, so we had three acts, 2020, um, and as a nerd, I will tell you this is really interesting, because remember, with each thing, remember we thought it was going to be two weeks? And you like hunger down, you're like, this is going to be two weeks, and then it was like, oh, okay, maybe it's two extra weeks. We can do that. Um, so the first act was like, yeah, this could be like, you know, just a, a couple, maybe a couple of months. Not a lot of dollars. Districts had no idea that this was going to go on, nor that there were going to be more federal investments. So that was the CARES Act, then we saw the CRISA Act, and finally the ARP Act. Um, and each one grew. And um, the nerd in me will tell you it's really interesting to look at spending trends when everybody thought this green one was their only one. Um, they weren't able to invest in programs and really comprehensive looks at what, what can move children to success in the same way that they were able to with art, and yet all those dollars are going away. So, um, ESSER was used in a variety of ways. ESSER 1 was uh, mostly property supplies and a little bit of salaries. By the third act, it was mostly salaries. That's what we needed, right? High dosage tutoring, summer programming, um, mentoring, guidance counselors, mental health supports. Those are all people, those aren't books, those aren't curriculum. Um, so you see that change, but when you invest in people and that money goes away, districts are faced with a real confrontation of what do we do now. So you've got the fiscal cliff, cliff which we talked about. Um, I will tell you that these conversations matter. Understanding, getting informed, and having real, authentic conversation at a local level matters. But, but weighing in, not just in the budget process, but year-round, to say what you're noticing is effective, what you're noticing that's not effective. How many of you are parents here? 
a couple of you are like, ah, yeah, <laughs> I gotta admit it. Right? We know that there are things that we see that happen in the schools where like that matter. That that's making a difference. Share that. Share those those moments all the time. It helps establish priorities. Um, it it helps it helps the district advocate. It helps you all advocate. Um, reaching out at the state level today. More than ever, I am going to tell you, this matters. Last year, our organization led a win for $150 million being invested at the state level into education. Accelerate the ECS formula, fix some of the brokenness, invest in kids. And the governor dropped his budget and is taking the vast majority of that back. Um, weighing in and letting your representative, your senator, know what matters to you so that they can advocate what matters for Montville, but your perspective too. That's what makes informed policy and legislation. Um, last year, it's what got us $150 million. This year is what will keep us 150 million. Um, but doing these things, like it's a nerdy thing to talk about school finance. I'm not expecting you all to go out and host pizza parties. Um, but I, I love a good pizza party, so if you ever want to do that, I'm down. Um, but don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, ask questions of me, ask questions of the district, the Board of Ed. And, and I think the other thing is, um, have grace in that conversation. It's been a rough few years in school districts and, and there, there is a lot of patience that is needed. So I'm happy to take questions. I noticed that there was a huge um, amount of range between what some districts are able to spend per pupil and what other districts are able to spend per pupil. And I'm wondering if there is a correlation as far as how the students are doing, what their achievement is. Not necessarily. I, um, the, the, the real connection to student success, um, wealthier, wider students do better in Connecticut. Wealthier and wider districts do better. Um, the student population in Connecticut is 50% uh, white and 50% black and brown students, and yet most, dis most kids are in a district that is either more than 75% white or more than 75% <coughs> black and brown. It connects to poverty, it connects to a lot. But when you start looking at districts that have similarities that may be spending um, different amounts. And I'll, I'll share with you that on the other side of the state, um, as of like last year, and I haven't looked at the data for this year, but Danbury was spending, I wanna say 5,000 or so dollars less than Norwalk, um, and their outcomes were similar. Um, so part of it is, you know, every, every stu student population has really unique needs, right? And those are two very different. So if you're figuring out what is working for your kids, and then you can deliver it efficiently, and there are two pieces to that. And the first is really that experimental. How do we figure out what our kids need? And once it's working, how can we get really good at it? Um, that happens. But, but the district that's paying $63,000 per student is not like having every kid nail every test and they're just blowing away. They're, they're doing better, but when you look at $20,000 or $60,000, um, part of it is some of those small districts are small. And rather than regionalizing, they choose to maintain an incredibly small district with significant level of resources. It's not, it's not necessarily a, a, it's a lack of efficiency that you're seeing. Thank you. 
not, not an, um, an increase in investment. Um, I will tell you this, I say this after every, if you're sitting here kind of like a jet engine like took off in front of you like, oh my, this was a lot, that, that's exactly right. It's, it's, it's a lot and um, it should be the start, right? Like you shouldn't feel like you leave here tonight and be like, I didn't get it, I should have gotten it all. You shouldn't get it all. Um, it's the start of, of learning, it's the start of a conversation. Feel free to email me and be like, wait, I have a question. Again, I'll be happy to come out and have coffee or pizza, um, and and we can talk through some of it. But this is the start. It's it, it is it's a lot, and this is just one of eleven funding formulas. So. <laughs>